In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is never shall be. Thank you. And yesterday, beloved in Christ, we celebrated the incarnation of our Lord. Not the manifestation in the flesh that takes place on December 25th, but the incarnation that took place when he was conceived in Mary's womb on that precious, most glorious, and mysterious day of the Annunciation. And the hymns are telling us over and over about God's great love for us and how He can do that which would be impossible for us to do. What's most likely for people who are so terrible, for people who are so selfish, selfish, for people who seek their own, the most likely conf- conclusion of a life lived in full of hypocrisy and dishonesty like we often live. What is it that we deserve? We, we mostly deserve to be told like it is. When we appear before our Savior, we deserve to be told, you lied to me and to yourself. Nice try. Nice try. But not so nice. But you know what, beloved? He doesn't act that way toward us. He becomes what he was not. He becomes what he never was before. How could it even be? So that he could unite our lowliness to his grandeur. And so that he can forgive those who probably don't even really know what forgiveness is. We don't really know what it means to be forgiven and to be brought into the embrace of God and the kingdom of heaven. The incomprehensible for the creature to be united with the uncreated. But he does that. He accomplishes that with very little of our assistance. In fact, he doesn't really need our assistance. He just needs our consent. And we celebrated that beautiful consent, the uniting of the fallen and limited human will and understanding, but the great dignity of the human will with the divine will. Yesterday, we celebrated the tender obedience and selfless trust of the Theotokos, of Mary who became the birth giver of God, which is what Theotokos means, birth giver of God. We celebrated with joy the beginning of our salvation. The beginning of our salvation which came to be known more widely at his incarnation, but then, I mean, his manifestation in the flesh when he was born. But as we talked about last week, even more so when he was lifted up on the cross for all men to see what true love really is. Today in the Orthodox Church, the fourth Sunday of Great and Holy Lent is a Sunday in which we commemorate our Holy Father among the saints, John Climacus who lived during the middle of the first millennium. He's given the last name Climacus unofficially. We don't know what his last name was, so we call him St. John Climacus, which means of the latter. He's also known as St. John of Sinai because he was a monastic who became the abbot of the monastery of St. Catherine, Mount Sinai. And he wrote this precious text called the Ladder of Divine Ascent. 
And I'm just going to start reading it to you today, and I'm not going to stop until we get to the last page. <laughs> it's that good. Some of you wish. Okay, Father. Please. Just kidding. I have to be careful with my dry sense of humor sometimes. <laughs> but the Ladder of Divine Ascent is a book that acknowledges that we live in a world of violence, in a way. Violence. Sin is an act of violence. Sin is an act of violence against the God who loves us and created us to love in return, whom we've chosen to reject. In, an, in that we were given the capacity to be like him, we confused our calling and we decided we'd rather like to be him rather than be like him and be with him. And so we performed an act of violence and we continue to against our Lord who is love. And of course, in doing that, we're inflicting violence upon ourselves. You know that there's only one God, the creator of heaven and earth. But when we confuse ourselves with God and when we try to do what only he can do, then also we become enemies of one another. We become enemies of one another. And in order to prove our God-likeness, you've probably all heard the term God complex. The only way we can prove it most often is at the expense of other people. Because that's what worldly power does. Rather than godly power, which was revealed again on the cross. Now some would call this season of great, the Great and Holy Fast a season of violence as well, but it's another kind of violence. The worldly violence, born from yours and my selfishness, has to be met with a different kind of violence. The violence that's referred to as asceticism in the church and her teachings. Asceticism comes from a Greek word, askesis, which just means like struggle, labor, training. And when we think of asceticism, we think of our Savior telling us the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The church has always understood that it's those who labor for the kingdom of God who prove that they desire it. Not that they can gain it. But when you want something, you work for it, don't you? You work for it. You want a promotion. You're doing everything you can to please your boss and co-workers or to look better than your co-workers. You labor for that, don't you? When you want to lose some weight, you get a gym membership and you never use it again. No, you, you work on it, hopefully. <laughs> Exercise, break a sweat. It doesn't feel good to break a sweat at first. It feels awkward and sore. you get sore. But you push through because you know the value that would come from that. If you love a sport, you practice it. You train. You work on your accuracy. You get the right equipment for it even. And have the right pair of shorts, the right shoes. You got to be able to move around in it, you know, and do. I mean, you do what it takes in order to progress. But it's ironic that with regard to the spiritual life, we just want it to happen to us. And it just doesn't, it doesn't just happen to us. You know, I like to say it does happen despite us. <laughs> because of our weak attempt. But it is, it's a meager offering that we can give to the God who has done everything for us. But we have to wage a certain kind of war. We have to inflict violence 
on ourselves. This is not the same as self-hatred. You know this. But there's no neutrality in the Christian life. There's no such thing as just coasting or skating along in the Christian life. We're either working, laboring to draw near to our Savior. Either we're being intentional about our relationship with Him. It's not about gaining our salvation. It's about responding to God's love by drawing near to Him. If God reaches out to you, He's reached across the expanse of eternity to touch you, and He gives you an inch to go so that you can grab His hand. Will you stand there and say, you didn't touch me? Or will you lean in a little bit, even if your back's a little sore, even if you've been discouraged and just touch his barely, just touch his finger so that he can draw you into his embrace? That's what our little effort is in the grand scheme of things. But to stand there motionless, or to lean back and pull away from him and then blame it on him. That's what we like to do. Blame God. But we're either laboring to draw near, we're being intentional to draw near to him, or we aren't. We commemorate St. John Climacus on this Sunday because he's written a work on the spiritual struggle. And it was written primarily for monastics, for a monastic audience. And so if you pick it up and read it, you will very, very quickly realize that there's much of it that you cannot directly apply to your life. Certain things. But there is much that you can. And that's the kind that you need to feel the good threat from. You need to feel a good challenge from if you read. Just like those passages in Scripture that your pencil doesn't want to underline. And in reflecting on the fact that we are warriors in a way, we're spiritual soldiers. Make them warriors ever invincible, we say, when we're initiating people into the church. And realizing that there is no neutrality. I called to mind an early Christian document called the Didache. People call it Didache in translation, but Didache, it's one of the, one of the first post-apostolic Christian writings. And it gives a very clear teaching on the fact that there are two ways. And I want to share a little bit of that with you and give just a little commentary. One section begins at the very start of the text. There are two ways one of life and one of death, but a great difference between the two ways. And the text proceeds to explain the first of these two ways, the, ways of, the way of life, by saying, the way of life is this. We need to hear this. The way of life is this. This is how the first Christians were striving to live. The way of life is this. We need to hear it because Christianity wasn't just for them in the first century, but it's for us who are living in the 21st century. The way of life is this. First, you shall love God who made you. Second, your neighbor as yourself. And all things whatsoever you would, you, you would that should not occur to you do not also to another. Never treat a person in a way that you would prefer not to be treated. And of these sayings, the teaching is this, bless those who curse you. Pray for your enemies. Fast for those who persecute you. For what reward is there if you love those who love you? Do not also the Gentiles do the same, but love those who hate you. Do not, excuse me, 
and you shall not have an enemy. Love those who hate you, and you shall not have an enemy. Abstain from fleshly and worldly lusts. If someone gives you a blow upon your right cheek, turn to him the other also, and you shall be perfect. This sounds very much like, and that's the end of that first quote, this sounds very much like what we hear in the gospel, and that's because it is what we hear in the gospel. It is what we hear in the gospel. It's what was being shared among the early Christians before the the gospel canon was officially put together. And it also sounds very much like what we refer to as the ascetical life, which we're experiencing due to our willing struggle. The monastics call it the good struggle. When we take it willingly, it becomes a good struggle to overcome our selfish desires so that we can learn how to love, how to tread the path which leads to life. And there's a positive asceticism and there's a negative. It's what we do, how we do it. But also there's a negative asceticism that we're avoiding. And we're avoiding what this didaki refers to as the way of death. And later in the text, they describe what the way of death is. And think about this list and identify in your life if any of, the, any of these little tastes of death, so to speak, are familiar to you. Because they, these are things that you may need to work on. These are things that I may need to work on by inflicting violence upon them. The way of death is this. First of all, it is evil and full of curse, murders, adulteries, Lusts, fornication, idolatries, magic arts, witchcrafts, thievery, false witnessing, hypocrisies, double-heartedness, deceit, haughtiness, depravity, self-will, greediness, filthy talking, jealousy, overconfidence, persecutors of the good, Hating truth, loving a lie, not knowing a reward for righteousness, not cleaving to good nor righteous judgment, watching not for that which is good, but for that which is evil, from whom meekness and endurance are for loving vanities, vengeance, not pitying a poor man, not laboring for the afflicted, not knowing him, God, that made them murderers of children, destroyers of the handiwork of God, turning away from him, from a person that is in want, afflicting him that is distressed, advocates of the rich, lawless judges at the poor, utter sinners, be delivered children, from all of these. Now there's something beautiful in here, hidden in tragedy. There's always beauty hidden in tragedy. Destroyers of the handiwork of God. You say, what is sin? What is corruption? It's that which destroys the handiwork of God, God's image in us, God's creation. And it's precisely the purpose of our spiritual struggle to be delivered, children, as we heard, from all of these things. The purpose of our spiritual struggle and the asceticism that is the common inheritance and calling and joint labor of all Christians. And we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. We need one another. You know, we must bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ It's more than just a text. Excuse me, I jumped ahead of my little notes. The need for this deliverance from death unto life is the reason behind the popularity and power of this book, The Ladder of Divine Ascent. We know that we're constantly eating, consuming, and living a life 
subject to death and we need to aim ourselves back at life again. And that's why this text is so popular. And it is more than just a text, but a monument to the belief that we can wage war on falsehood. We can wage war on falsehood. By coming to see ourselves as we are and admitting that we cannot commingle light and darkness. You ever tried to have it simultaneously light and dark in the same room at the same time? It's impossible. Go do an experiment with your kids and see if it works. <laughs> Although they're pretty clever. They'll be like, it's dark in the closet or something. But light and dark cannot be commingled. Physical light and neither can light and darkness be commingled within ourselves. And that's why we're in the process, the healing process, which is slow and gradual and glorious and difficult of being cleansed of all of the, you could say, the darknesses within ourselves. Let us fear not to be illumined by the light of Christ and purified by it. Our desire, beloved, rather than to hide away those dark recesses within us, is to just be completely ignited with the life of God. Beacons of life and hope. And this isn't merely about moral perfection, meaning do your checklist, live a good life, be a good person, and then God will be happy with you. No, it's about being desperately in love with Jesus Christ. Loving Him, and that's why you give up things you don't need. That these distractions that are, am I thinking about God right now? No. I'm, when you get a taste of the kingdom of God, even the sweetest earthly flavor is pales in comparison. No earthly riches compared to a split second of an encounter with our Lord Jesus, let alone in eternity with Him. And we're preparing for that eternity and we're demonstrating even in our lives, beloved in Christ, through our own humble, hopefully, and authentic repentance and asceticism, we're demonstrating a life that has different, a different source of riches, different source of values, and when we struggle authentically and we become a little less opaque, we become a little brighter, a little more honest, a little less withheld, a little more caring, unafraid to share our faith, unafraid to lose something on account of our faith, then the world, too, as a byproduct of our repentance, comes to be convinced that the God that we serve is real. But if we leave him here and on 21236 Poplar Way and not at the grocery store or anywhere else, then they will know that he's just a figment of our imagination. But if we bear this reality with us wherever we go and live as those who believe in God, who really trust in him, who know that if God is on our side, who can be against us? Then we can fear nothing at all, but that God wouldn't give us enough time to work out, give us one more day for repentance, one more moment to draw near to Him, one more moment maybe to give another person a little tiny taste of hope, like the hope that I've barely begun to, begun to understand. Worldly violence is met with a different kind of violence, a hopeful violence, a violence of reclaiming our personhood, a violence of not imposing God's love, but affecting the world with God's love, with true love. The love that's a result from encounter with the God-man Jesus Christ, who was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, on that beautiful, wonderful, mysterious day. So that, just like as he was formed within Mary, 
he would be formed in us as well. May it be so. May that beautiful formation of God within us, the encompassing of God of our being by the grace of the all-pervading Holy Spirit take place in our lives. And may God grant us the opportunity foremost to celebrate His holy resurrection, to celebrate His holy and glorious and wonderful resurrection. Amen.